Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for coming. I, my heart is full, full of warm fuzzies right now because I know this is the last session of the last day and it's kind of like voluntarily showing up for the last day of school right before summer break. So I really appreciate that you're here and uh, we do not have a lot of time together, unfortunately. So whatever it says I was supposed to talk about in your little pamphlet thing is probably not what's going to happen. So this will be a, an adventure for us all for the next 20 minutes. We'll see what happens. Um, my presentation is called Meet Your Meat, as you can tell. And what we're going to look at is basically two things, and then maybe we'll have question and answers. Uh, but I really, first of all, just want to do like a quick zippy tour for, um, to show us how meat went from this food that was generally appreciated and loved to something that we're all kind of told is a bad thing and that we should feel bad if we enjoy it. We should feel bad if we eat a lot of it. And so that's the first thing we're going to do. But then I'm going to do something a little bit different. And we're going to look at some legitimate risks that do come from a high meat consumption, including red meat, all these other things that uh, we generally embrace on paleo diets. And I want to do this just because I think it's so easy to find information destroying the whole um, argument against cholesterol, uh, dietary cholesterol, and saturated fat, and all those other things that we're usually told about red meat and meat in general. And especially if you go to any paleo blog, you'll be able to find things that kind of defend meat from that perspective. But at the same time, I do think there are risks that come from certain types of meats, um, certain meat consumption habits, especially in the West. And I think we should be aware of those things because uh, just having that awareness will make us all healthier. So let's get started. Uh, anyone know who that picture is on the side of the screen? This is a guy named Nikolai Anishkov. Familiar name to anybody? This was about 100 years ago. Um, he started doing experiments with rabbits and feeding them dietary cholesterol. And this, this really is kind of the beginning of the end for meat in terms of it being a healthy food for us, even though it didn't really have this kind of effect back then. What he found was that when he fed rabbits uh, cholesterol from food, it made them develop atherosclerosis similar to what they were seeing in humans at the time. And this was the first time anyone had discovered that sort of thing. So it was pretty, pretty cool to be able to induce that kind of uh, plaque buildup in an experiment in a controlled setting. And so this was, again, the first discovery of this, uh, the mechanism there. And there's, of course, a big problem with extrapolating that kind of research to humans, and that is, what do bunnies normally eat? Do they eat vegetation, like carrots? Or do they eat foods with cholesterol, like babies? <laughs> they, I think we, <laughs> I think we know the answer to that question, We've, for the most part. Uh, they do eat vegetation, and so they are not well adapted to handle dietary cholesterol. It's just not something that occurs in their diet. In contrast to that, humans definitely have a different type of response to dietary cholesterol. Uh, some of you may have seen this study. It came out in 1991 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was called Normal Plasma Cholesterol in an 88-Year-Old Man Who Eats 25 Eggs a Day. Has anyone seen this study? Raise of hands. It's pretty cool. You guys should go look it up. It's a good one to throw at anyone uh, who tells you you should limit your egg consumption because it's going to give you high cholesterol. Uh, and this was a study of a man, 88 years old. He was in fine health, and what he was doing was eating 20 to 30 eggs a day. And he had been doing that for at least 15 years. It might have been longer, but he couldn't even remember when he started. And his only problems were poor memory, constipation, and loneliness. And he was probably lonely because all he did was eat eggs. <laughs> but his cardiovascular health was excellent. And again, that's not a diet I recommend for people in general. But the fact that a human could survive on this is something that, uh, you know, if you tried to do this with a rabbit, the rabbit would just like explode with cholesterol. So obviously there's a difference in the species here. Um, anyway, the good news is that Anishkov did not actually think his research was applicable to human diets. And so we should give major kudos to the scientists back then because they weren't jumping to conclusions about their animal experiments applying to humans. And it was in the 1960s, over 40 years later, almost 50 years, that there was a resurgence in this interest in cholesterol, including dietary cholesterol. 
And there were a few clinical trials done at the time. A lot of them were not very well designed, uh, but some of them did show that there was some change in cholesterol from people who were eating a higher amount of dietary cholesterol. And so that was um, kind of the first strike for meat, because meat, of course, contains cholesterol. And by the 1970s, our big associations, like the USDA and the American Heart Association, were starting to actively tell people to cut down on cholesterol. So again, meat got kind of a bad rap for that. And then the other thing that happened was the American Heart Association. Now this is a big agency, and this is where we get so much of our information. They have a huge influence on the American public. They tell us what we should be eating, and they are supposed to have authority. So in 1957, the Heart Association were saying that they were skeptical of any link between fat and heart disease. They thought there just wasn't enough evidence. It didn't seem compelling to them. Four years later, in 1961, all of a sudden, they did a major change, and they're suddenly directing people to this uh, lower meat, lower fat diet if they were overweight, if they'd already suffered a heart attack or stroke, if they had high cholesterol or blood pressure, and if they led lives of relentless frustration. <laughs> and that's a direct quote. You gotta love the AHA. They're so funny. And <laughs> so, so obviously that applies to quite a few people, too. So this was the first time that we had a major organization telling us that we needed to cut back on fat. And of course, meat contains fat, and so it got whipped again in that sense. And I should also mention that the fact that they made that big 180 switch in their, their recommendations wasn't because they came across new research um, condemning fat and linking it to heart disease. It was because they dropped a bunch of their committee members and took on some new ones, and one of those new committee members was none other than Ansel Keys. Who knows who Ansel Keys is? Yeah, you guys love him, don't you? <laughs> we all do. So he obviously had some very strong opinions about certain things, especially fat. And he made those opinions known within the American Heart Association. So that's, that was the beginning of the end for fat being good. And then the other major thing that happened was the McGovern Report. Anyone heard of the McGovern Report? Also called the Dietary Goals for the United States. Yeah, so that was a major thing too. And this was, uh, it was developed by the Senate Select Committee, which was headed by George McGovern. And this was a guy who had recently gone to Nathan Pritikin's Low Fat Longevity Center. Pritikin is one of those super, super, super low fat, like under 10% of total calories fat people. And he believes that is the way to reverse a lot of diseases. And so George McGovern was kind of under the spell of Pritikin at, at that time. And so that was influencing the direction that the committee was taking with their dietary recommendations for the country. And um, the Dietary Goals for the United States, which was their official document, was actually written by a guy named Nick Mottern, who was a vegetarian himself. And he was a huge fan of Ansel Keys. So that's, you can kind of see how that was shaped by a lot of political influences and things that weren't exactly scientific. But once these recommendations were released to the public and once they became national policy, they became the basis for um, basically the last, let's see what year is it even, almost 30 years of our nutrition recommendations, over 30 years actually, uh, starting with the food guide pyramid, my pyramid, my plate, and certainly into the future, whatever they develop next will also be following the stuff that was established back in 1977. So that's kind of the brief history of some, some of the major milestones that led to meat being bad. And there's so much more I could say about that, but again, we don't have a lot of time, so just that's the quick sippy version. But now I want to look at some reasons that meat might actually have some issues, um, especially even in our community where a lot of us focus on grass-fed meat and we think we're doing everything right, getting really high-quality stuff, there's still some issues that we're not realizing because of our um, indoctrination in our culture in terms of what meat is and in terms of what part of the animals we should be eating. And so we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. So if you walk into any American grocery store, you'll usually see something like this in the meat section. Basically, we have one row of muscle meat, another row of muscle meat, another row of muscle meat, a few more rows of muscle meat, and then some lettuce to decorate it in between. <laughs> and there's uh, quite a few other things on animals that are edible <laughs> that we've forgotten about. And here are just a few pictures. There's things like cartilage. Uh, these are tendons. Those are testicles. You can eat those. Those are bones. Those are uh, pork hocks. And that's brain. 
who eats brain these days apart from like Hannibal Lecter? Not a lot of people. Do you guys, do you guys, oh, there, we have brain eaters in the room. Oh, that's wonderful. Good for you. Um, uh, what was that? The French. the French, yeah. The French do a lot of things. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, so organ meats. This is so important. We've forgotten about organ meats. Well, maybe not all of us have forgotten, but by and large, America, we've gone towards these tender cuts of meats that are basically all from muscle, and we've forgotten about all those other parts that are inside of the animal that we can eat and that provide incredible amounts of nutrition. And th these are some radial graphs from uh, nutri nutritiondata.self.com, and they... Uh, just to quick explain how to explain this, I guess I can't point, but if you look at those purple spokes on the graph, those are vitamins, and the white spokes are minerals, and you can ignore the yellow stuff, that's the, the troublesome nutrients, according to nutritiondata.com, which can, in, uh, consists of sodium, cholesterol, and saturated fat. So maybe those aren't so troublesome, but basically, if we're going to look at a couple of these, and uh, just compare these, look at the, the amount of nutrients that are filled in here. For beef muscle, that's the first one. You can see there's, there's a good amount of uh, minerals and vitamins, but not that many. Next one is beef brain. You got quite a few more. Beef heart, still doing better than muscle. Beef liver, awesome. Look at all that, the nutrition. Beef kidney, also awesome. And you could do this with pretty much any organ, and it's going to always outshine muscle in terms of nutritional content. And so that's an important thing to remember, because if you're focusing on muscle meat, you're really losing a lot of opportunity um, to get a lot of micronutrients that are in uh, organ meats that just aren't present in muscle. And another issue with focusing on muscle meat to the exclusion of other parts of the animal is something called an amino acid called methionine, which I spelled out for my own benefit <laughs> as well as for yours. And muscle meat is very, very high in this amino acid. And there are a few issues, and it's an essential amino acid, so it's not like this is a bad thing, just point blank. Um, but one of the problems with it is that it generates homocysteine, and that can be an issue if you have impaired capacity to recycle homocysteine. And uh, there's, there's a lot you could say about homocysteine, but basically if you have very high levels of it, that tends to correlate with uh, higher blood coagulation, so you're at higher risk of heart disease. There's some other bad stuff that can happen to you, but basically you don't want to have high homocysteine, but having a very high intake of methionine can cause that. And another issue is that uh, a high intake of methionine can deplete the amino acid glycine, which is present in things like skin and bones and connective tissue and all that stuff we've been discarding. And so the cool thing is if you eat the whole animal, you're getting this great balance of all the amino acids. But if you just focus on muscle meats, you're, mo you're missing out on a lot of stuff uh, that is whack, like throwing your ratios out of whack, basically, because for the most of human history, you've been eating nose to tail, and it's only a recent phenomena that we've been selectively picking the parts of the animal to eat. And I think that's important to realize, especially in the, the sense that we're trying to achieve some kind of ancestral framework with our diets, because it's very Neolithic to only eat certain parts of the animal and not use the rest. And um, one of the other things with methionine is that Restricting it can boost blood levels of glutathione, which is a great antioxidant. And something pretty interesting that I don't know if many people are aware of, but uh, you've all heard of those calorie restricted models of animals that end up living longer, right? Well, one of the ways to achieve that exact same effect is to limit their methionine intake. And if you do that, just limit, uh, lim or minimize their intake of that one amino acid, it achieves the same effect as restricting calories without actually having to restrict calories. And what's also interesting is if you uh, supplement those animals with glycine, the same effect happens too. Same effect as calorie restriction in terms of longevity. So this kind of points to something, and I don't want to say this definitely applies to humans because those animals are usually on purified diets and it's a very poor representation of human reality. But this is a good argument for, again, eating the whole animal and getting proper intakes of both of those amino acids. So this is another good argument of don't just focus on mu muscle meats, but look at the rest of the animal and focus on getting those weird parts that you see in the store and look really creepy, but they're really good for you. 
So some good sources of glycine, which is that amino acid you should be having a lot of if you're eating a high intake of meat, especially muscle meat. Things like gelatin, broth made from bone, pig ears, skin. Eat your own if you have to. It's so good for you. <laughs> Collagen, connective te tissue, and eat those in abundance with your muscle meat. And you can make broth. Like, look at that. It looks like a chicken apocalypse inside of a putt. <laughs> it's great. It's terrible looking. But if you ever make uh, broth with this, has anyone made bone broth or foot broth or anything like that? Good. Oh, that makes me so happy. It's so great. And especially if you use things like feet. If anyone has tried this, and pork feet too, it turns the broth into something that has so much gelatin in it that you put it in the fridge and it's like meat jello when you take it out. It's so cool. It's like, it's, it's literally jello. It's awesome. So if no one knows how to do that, uh, there's some great literature online. The Weston A. Price Institute has some instructions, I think. And uh, I recommend getting in the practice of making bone broths and other kinds of broths, because they're just amazing. And one other place we can look is into other cultures who have not lost, uh, or they haven't adopted that same just fixation on muscle meat, and they still retain some traditional practices. Like this is cow foot jelly. Has anyone ever seen this? I, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, it's common uh, with some Eastern Jews, especially on Sabbath, it's usually made for that purpose, and it's made from boiled cow's feet, and it turns into like cow feet uh, jello, it, it's, look at that, it's awesome, and it's full of gelatin, and it's delicious, and it's good for you, and nobody in America, almost nobody in America knows what it is, but it's a cool traditional food, and there's other things too, like look at this, this is really isn't that horrifying? It is horrifying, so let's make it even bigger. <laughs> that, this, is, this is a sheep head on a plate, and it's a traditional meal in the Middle East. Look how much awesome stuff, okay, it looks gross, but look how much awesome stuff is in there. You have a brain that's full of so much nutrition that hopefully you can access after you eat the rest of it. You have this face that's full of connective tissue and tendons and skin, and it's, it's got so much goodness in it. And, I mean, it's kind of scary to, like, have a food watch you as you eat it. <laughs> but if you think about the nutritional content of this meal, it would just be fantastic. And I'm not saying that you have to go buy heads of sheep. I mean, they look like that is kind of creepy, I know. But just keep in mind, though, it's eating the whole animal again. There's good stuff everywhere, and it's not just in the muscle meat that we usually buy. And if you are creeped out by like huge heads on your plate, you can always eat things like anchovies or sardines. These are like the two bite brownies of the nutri or the animal kingdom. But you don't have to. They don't have to be looking at you for that long before they're gone. So I recommend those too because that's a whole animal right there in that little can. And uh, I also recommend for people who haven't seen those strange meats, look at Asian markets, look at farmers markets, um, specialty meat markets. If you hunt around, you should find a lot of weird animal parts. Like this is an Asian, this is, well, this is not just like an Asian market in America, this is an Asian market in Asia. And that's a whole pig on the table, like chopped up into pieces. You can buy the eyes down at the bottom, you can buy the ears, you can buy whatever else is on there. There's like a foot on there. This is how it should be. We shouldn't have just limited amounts of certain animal parts that we can buy. We should have the whole thing, and you should be buying all of it. Okay. So there are also some issues with our cooking methods. And this is disappointing to anyone maybe who ate the meal a few hours ago and it was pretty charred. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you why that was bad. Um, there's something that occurs uh, when you cook meat at high temperatures. There's actually two things that can occur. One is a, a compound called heterocyclic amines. And this is created when um, at, uh, usually above 300 degrees when you cook meat. Uh, it's a combination of compounds, amino acid sugars, and creatine from muscles that react at high temperatures and form this new compound. And another thing that happens kind of in the same way is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, so I don't have to say that long thing again ever. Uh, and these are formed usually during grilling. When you put meat on a grill and some of the juice or the fat drips down and then it like excites the flame and the flame goes up and it bathes the meat. Uh, and that puts pHs on the surface of the meat. And those also can occur when you um, smoke food. But it's, if you see char on a food after you've cooked it, there's usually some bad stuff in there. And what these things do is they can result in DNA mutations. Um, after your body metabolizes them and bioactivates them by specific enzymes, and what happens uh, in animal models, which is 
kind of our best evidence right now because it's really hard to study this in humans. Um, in animal models, it can cause things like cancer, especially colon cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, often in rodents. And uh, supplement, supplementing PAHs in rodents can also cause leukemia and lung cancer. And if this translates to humans, the cancer risk among person to person probably varies because we all have different levels of those specific enzymes. And it all depends on how much your body is converting into these dangerous compounds uh, after you consume them. So it's not, it's not very easy to study and it's hard to say how relevant the animal research is to humans um, because it's hard to measure HA and PHA exposure partially because you have to rely on things like food frequency questionnaires, which are just awful because no one remembers what they eat or how hot their food got when they were cooking it. And um, we also get different environmental exposures from other sources. And again, there's that individual variation of enzyme activity. Um, but we do have some existing human studies that are of the poor quality observational kind that I usually hate, so I, I just hate citing this at all, but I just want to bring it up. And they do show some correlations between um, well done barbecued and fried meat and certain cancers, especially pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer and prostate cancer. So what do you do? I recommend for those who really want to be prudent and who are a little concerned about this, especially if you have any history of cancer in your family or if, you're just, if you just want to be very OCD about your food, um, use gentle cooking methods like stewing and steaming and anything other than you know, like grilling and frying, that really high heat stuff. Um, and avoid consuming too much charred or smoked food. And if you see something that has a lot of char on it, just cut that off and don't eat it. And avo avoid directly exposing meat to open fire or temperatures above 300 degrees as much as possible. And this is kind of cool too. If you do have some, something that you heated pretty high, uh, marinating it in olive oil, lemon juice, or gar and garlic, a combination of those things, has been shown to reduce uh, the HCA content by as much as 90%, which is pretty good. And you can also marinate stuff in red wine and it has the same effect. And if you're going to grill or barbecue anything, you can partially cook it using a gentler method and then put it on the high heat just for a shorter period of time. And then you'll still get that cooked uh, like high heat flavor without all the damage. And then when cooking on a high heat surface, just flip the meat like frequently, like as much as possible. And that, those are some strategies if you want to reduce your exposure to those things. And the next one, did anyone see Chris Kresser's talk? Because I was actually finishing my presentation while his was going on, and then I realized I didn't want to repeat too much of his inf information. So I'm sorry if you've heard this just recently. Um, but another issue that will affect some par portion of the population, not everybody, but some portion, are iron storage disorders, like hereditary hemochromatosis, um, which is when your iron absorption goes into overdrive and you're just absorbing way too much with your body not having ac any mechanism uh, of releasing iron once it's in there, unless you're a menstruating female, in which case you're lucky. Um, and then, so in the US population, the main mutations responsible for uh, genetic hemochromatosis affect up to 20% of the population. And if you look around and count like four people around you, one of you guys is gonna probably be affected by some form of iron storage disorder. And that's a little scary. Um, again, if you saw Chris Kresser's talk, you should probably know that if somebody has very high iron levels for a long period of time, it can result in things like liver disease and heart disease, uh, diabetes, arthritis, and skin pigmentation. And so those are obviously things most people probably want to avoid. And the scary part about this is it usually takes many, many, many years before symptoms to show up. So if anyone is concerned they may have this, um, the greatest risk is among those with Northern European ancestry, especially, especially men with Celtic descent. And premenopausal women have some protection, but after menopause, you lose that monthly release of iron, so you're back at risk too. And if you're paleo and you have some form of iron storage disorder, one scary thing to think about is that you know, you're ditching all those healthy whole grains, which uh, a lot of us are phytate phobes at this point, and we try to avoid uh, consuming too much phytate. But the problem is when we dump that in phytate or phytic acid, it binds to minerals, including iron, and uh, actually prevents us from absorbing them. And usually it's a good thing to minimize the amount of phytate we consume because we want to keep a lot of those minerals like calcium and zinc 
But in the case of iron, in the case of people who don't want to be absorbing more iron, when you eliminate all those high phytate foods, even the whole grains, what you do is you increase your ability to absorb iron. So in some cases, that could actually have a, a negative consequence. Um, and the good news is there are tests available to see if you have some form of hereditary hemochromatosis. And you can also bypass the doctor and use the website 23andme.com. Has anyone heard of that website? It's amazing. It's a genetic testing website. And I think what you do is you spit into a vial or something and you send it off and you get all this genetic information about yourself, ancestry, uh, things that you're likely to get uh, diseases for. And so if you're concerned about that, that's something to consider. And so if you do have iron overload and it's diagnosed or you're just noticing that your, uh, your blood tests are coming back very high iron, there are a few things that you can do to fix that problem. And one is to donate blood, which is probably the best option because then other people are benefiting from your loss of blood. Um, but there's other stuff too, like drinking coffee or tea with meals that contain high iron foods because they contain substances that actually block your iron absorption. And avoid eating vitamin C rich foods uh, along with like red meat or other high iron foods because vitamin C greatly enhances the absorption, especially of plant forms of iron. And you can, if, you, you know, if you're really desperate, you can eat less red meat. I hate saying that to this crowd, but one, one possibility for you is to eat less red meat and just focus more on nutrient density in the meat you do eat. Focus on organ meats and you know, dump some of the, the muscle meat. And of course, there are other solutions as well that I don't recommend as much. Uh, but mostly, for the most part, just donate blood and you can consider more creative options if you need to. <laughs> so in summary, um, what I would recommend for everybody sitting in this room right now, if you're doing some kind of ancestral diet, assuming you're eating meat, assuming you enjoy eating meat, and assuming it forms an appreciable quantity of your diet, I would say focus on eating nose to tail of your animals. Don't just focus on muscle meat. Look for those strange organ meats. Look for feet and bones and necks. All that stuff that looks gross, it's so good for you. And find ways to make it appetizing for yourself because it's actually pretty tasty if you can get around like the whole eating a face thing, you know. So, uh, <laughs> um, and then on top of that, definitely limit the amount of high heat cooking that you do. Even though grilling and barbecuing is really delicious, it, it, you know, there, it seems like there's something there that's probably going to cause some issues, at least for some people. And if you want to be really prudent with your diet, and if you're really after being in great health, um, use gentler forms of cooking on your meat. You know, it's already dead. You don't need to like, kill it again with really hot stuff. Just be nice to it. And then if you have some form of iron storage disorder, uh, definitely donate blood or curb your iron consumption if you have that, that, uh, that issue. But I should mention that if you don't have any form of iron storage issue, um, I don't think there's much evidence showing that decreasing your consumption of iron would really do you much benefit. So this is mostly for people who are diagnosed with that sort of thing. And those are my recommendations. And I, I uh, guess we're done for today. And I hope uh, our time together was as good for you as it was for me, because I love you all. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I think we do have a little time for uh, some questions, if you guys want to ask Denise a few questions. Maybe we can just see that Easter Bunny photo again. OK. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, um, start over here. So uh, my question is about, you know, that old saying, eat what ails you. Uh -huh. um, and I guess it's true sometimes and sometimes it's not. You can eat thyroid and it could, you know, cure what ails you. And I think if you eat testicles, it can't, <laughs> it can't cure what ails you. But, um, <laughs> and I don't think tripe does that either. But my mm -hmm. question is, uh, judging from what you say on your blog, what you eat, Mm -hmm. um, I think you eat a lot less red meat than, than most people here, and you eat a lot more plant matter. Yeah. Um, and a lot more weird shit. <laughs> what have you ever, and you self experiment a lot. Yeah. Um, 
have you ever tried to eat what ails you and do you ever eat specific uh, strange you know uh, awful in order to address some body concern that's an interesting question I've never approached it in that manner like eating what ails you and I guess I've never considered it probably anything that's valid, you know, apart from being like an old wives tale or something, but I'm sure there are benefits for things like thyroid, like as you mentioned, um, I, I don't know, I ate raw goat testicle once and it didn't do anything to me, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't really comment further than that, but uh, my own approach is mostly, um, I, I really try to take an intuitive approach and I'm really anti-diet micromanaging because I think that the stress of that is often enough to outweigh the benefits of eating healthfully. So what I do is if something looks just completely gross to me and I can't imagine myself putting it in my mouth, then I won't eat it. Um, like liver, for example, liver looks wonderful to me many times when I see it in the fridge, but there are times when I look at it and seeing it makes me want to throw up and at that point, I figure, you know, I've had probably enough iron or whatever minerals that I'm kind of topped off on. So I take a more intuitive approach rather than like some kind of logical laid out, well, my stomach hurts, so I'm going to eat an animal stomach kind of thing, if that makes any sense. I hope that answered your question. I'm not quite sure it did. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we can alternate. Hi. Hi. Uh, I've heard from you and, and elsewhere at this conference about the nutrient density of liver. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard anecdotally that liver being the toxin filter of the body might have some toxins in it. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Um, as the toxin filter, I don't think that it actually contains those toxins. I think that what it does is it detoxifies them and then turns them into other compounds that end up in different places in your body. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I've not heard of any problems uh, associated with liver in that respect, apart from maybe getting too much of certain minerals or iron or, or something like that if you're eating it very, very frequently. So I think it's one of those foods that is so nutrient dense that you don't need to eat it with you know great frequency like every day or anything, but use it more supplementarily. But yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You kind of stole yeah. my question. Okay. Uh, I was concerned with the uh, recommendation to eat liver. A lot of what we can get by us is mostly just your grocery store liver, which I'm sure mm -hmm. is from grain-fed cows. Yeah. Um, any difference then in the quality of the liver from the grain-fed versus the grass-fed, which I, with storage problems and all is hard You know, I, I'm sure there is, but I'm not sure that it affects the nutritional profile enough to make a huge difference, especially if you're not eating it in huge quantities. It really is like a supplement because liver, just a tiny piece of liver has so much in it in terms of nutrition. Um, the other things that you'd be concerned about are like the omega-6, omega-3 profile being changed by a, a grain consumption for the animal. But I think in the case of liver, you usually eat it in such small quantities that that kind of thing wouldn't matter as much. So that's my perspective on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Um, Thank you. Part of, uh, part of your discussion of meat so far seems to be focused mostly on big animals. Mm -hmm. I've recently come back from China, and uh, could you comment on both the nutritive value and the sustainability of, of a lot more people adjusting their cultural attitudes, going back to what we've done for millions of years, and eating more bugs? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were gonna, I knew someone was going to say that. Um, honestly, if you guys can get past the yuck factor of eating insects, they are amazingly nutritious. And I've seen a lot of arguments about sustainability. You know, this is an untapped resource, especially in the West. There's bugs everywhere, and they're easy. They're so small, but they're easy to, like, acquire. And I know it's gross, but I, I don't know. I ate a chocolate-covered grasshopper once, and that was my only experience with that. But I do think that um, if, you can, if people can get past that, and that's the hardest part is the yuck factor, and I, I'm sure that's enough to stop people for life in many cases. But um, that is an interesting avenue to explore, especially if food supply becomes iffy at any situation. Um, good, good point, though. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks. Right, OK, before I ask my Hi. question, I just want to comment about the bugs. Yeah. Lobster is just a big bug. <laughs> Lobster. <and> everyone <laughs> eats that. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Hey, I had a question about the, the cooking methodology, yeah. uh, because that's something that always concerns me, especially the, the heterocyclic amines. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts, first of all, on cooking with a pressure cooker? Is that safe to cook red meat in there? You know, I haven't really looked specifically at pressure cooker, cookers, but I'm pretty sure, because um, it doesn't actually make food that much hotter, does it? It just uses... 
Yeah, I, does, I, I don't think it gets up to 300 degrees. Yeah, I don't think so either. And ground. I think that's the main concern. I think that's actually a good way to bypass that really high exposure to heat. Um, so if you do use that method, I wouldn't see anything wrong with that. And also, I've, I've read that sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables counteract heterocyclic amines. Is, is there any science behind that? It's or? possible. I didn't come across that literature, but it's very possible um, just in terms of, I mean, It was in Paleo Magazine, by the way. It was from so Paleo Magazine. That's where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, then I'm sure it's credible. So. <laughs> um, I think it's very possible there are things you can probably eat in conjunction with high temperature cooked meat that will kind of counteract those effects. I would, I would play it safe for the most part and not eat, like, obviously blackened food, but uh, if there is some question about how hot your food has gotten and you supplement it with some other food, I think that's a good idea. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Along those same lines, uh, in avoiding overcooking, I'm worried that I'm going to go to the other extreme and kill myself, and so <laughs> I've heard of some people, and I'm about to try this, not cooking the meat at all, good grass-fed meat, kind of disinfecting it in like an iodine solution and having at it. Have you ever tried it? I'm actually mostly a raw foodist <laughs> myself, so I don't eat a lot of uh, raw animal products apart from like sushi and raw eggs, but I do know people who do eat raw meat that way, and I don't, I mean, I don't want to say something and then go on record and have someone die, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be very careful about what I'm saying, but um, if you eat really high quality stuff and it's been treated well and it hasn't been like sitting out and it's from a good animal and that sort of thing, um, there are ways to prepare raw meat and make it... Uh, not that dangerous. In fact, I think there's uh, some sort of Japanese sashimi that's made out of red meat. It's like, is this, oh, is it made out of horse? Oh, it's made out of horse. I didn't know that. Uh, but sliced very thinly. It's just raw meat. They eat it over there. It's a delicacy. So they do it in other cultures. Um, I would say be careful. Go easy on on a, what you're doing. Don't like jump into a, a huge pile of raw meat. But but. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've, ha I've dabbled in that sort of thing, and I've never gotten sick from it. So that's my N equals one. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Great Hello. Talk. Thank you. I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I had a question. I know a lot of people talk about it. I think uh, Perfect Health Diet, they had a series on this, and that some people think pork, uh, there could be a problem with that when you compare it to other meats. Do you think there's a problem? What's your take on it? I, you know, I'm, for some reason, I'm really prejudiced against pig. Like, I just can't eat it myself. It just, it never has tasted very good to me. Even bacon, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I know, oh, I hate those groans. Uh, <laughs> oh, now the Rotten Tomatoes come out. Uh, uh, I haven't actually looked into that research as much. I do recall the blog entry that came out about that on the Perfect Health Diet website, and I know it did stir up a bunch of controversy. Um, but without looking further into that, the data and what was being discussed there, I don't want to comment further because I won't have anything educated to say on it. So, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much.